So uh, we know that the uh, American Jewish community today uh, seems particularly divided, and uh, many of us remember not that long ago when Israel was the great unifier in the community now uh, too often, unfortunately, it seems to be uh, a source of, of conflict. And a number of rabbis say to me that, that, they, that speaking about uh, Israel in a sermon is, is the third rail that uh, people are very concerned. So I wanted to pose to you um, just sort of how you view this issue that's discussed a lot about who's in the tent, who's, who's out of the tent. Um, where do, you, where do you draw the line? And how are people uh, able to express criticism of Israel without feeling marginalized by others in the community? So maybe we'll start with Yehuda. I definitely see in our work, and just as an observer of the Jewish community, the deep anxiety around te talking about Israel, teaching around Israel, and the consequence that has emerged uh, for a lot of our rabbis who come study at Hartman who say, um, since I want to keep my job, I won't give sermons on Israel, um, with the consequence being that a year worth of no sermons on Israel means that Israel has now been taken out of being a serious Jewish conversation, that that anxiety makes Israel less a part of a Jewish conversation and therefore implicitly sends a message that Jews can't talk about Israel the same way that we talk about uh, things that we care about and things that matter to us. I personally am not particularly animated by the question of who's in the tent and who's out of the tent. I'm much more interested in a conversation around Israel that invites people to participate in it. Right? I'm less interested in if you say this, if you believe that, if you do this, if you do that, you're not part of an Israel conversation. What alarms me a lot more is that the conversation around Israel is both intellectually and affectively a, a somewhat poisoned conversation right now. Intellectually, we have suffered from a Jewish community that has largely broadcast political messages as the way in which you're involved with Israel, or advocacy messages which don't invite people to think critically about Israel's challenges, but require them to subscribe to a particular ideology if they want to be part of the Jewish people. And affectively, you can go on programs like A Birthright Israel or others that make you like Israel. You can come to a falafel night at a synagogue, but um, when Israel is actually confronting major challenges, when it's in the news for reasons that people don't like, it becomes harder and harder to amount a credible feeling of, um, I, I have an intrinsic love for Israel. Whereas for one generation of Jews, the experience of living through the Holocaust or being the children of survivors of the Holocaust, the experience of 1948, 1967, 1973, and perhaps most profoundly Entebbe, um, was sufficient. It didn't matter whether you understood what Israel meant in the historical destiny of the Jewish people. You happen to have been, call it unlucky or lucky, to have lived through times in Jewish history that made the state of Israel simply a deep part of your Judaism in ways that were inseparable. So there's nothing. If you lived through 1967 and Tebi, there's virtually nothing that the state of Israel can confront, challenge, or fail in that will sever your Jewish identity and relationship to Israel. And if you happen to have been um, lucky or unlucky to have been born in 1977, uh, and, and your experience of the world is not mediated through the miracles of Israel's survival or the fact that the Jewish people have overcome such enormous um, obstacles since the Holocaust, um, what is animating that love, support, and desire to be part of a serious conversation around Israel? And if the models that have been created by the Jewish community have been created entirely by a generation for whom a uh, relationship to Israel was intuitive and obvious, I'm not sure that it will continue to be intuitive, intuitive and obvious for the generations that follow. So what I would like to see happen is the construction of an Israel conversation that worries a lot less about whether if you say this, you can't be part of a tent of Israel, and actually take seriously, look, Israel has to be a meaningful and thick part of a, of a serious Jewish identity. You can't be a serious Jew if you're not in relationship with Israel. But that doesn't mean that you close off either your minds to the questions that Israel faces or the, the complexities that are surfaced for a Jewish community that wants to feel comfortable in America and be in relationship with the Jewish people and its state in a different part of the world. So <coughs> uh, I, I think that there is a lot of exaggeration implicit in the question about the depth of the division. There is a tendency towards indifference that we see developing. 
but it's true of every issue. It's not just relating to Israel. And even more, there's a tendency towards ignorance. If people don't see the miracles today, every day almost, we didn't see the miracles that have happened since 60, since 77. The rescue of Iranian Jews, Yemeni Jews, Ethiopian Jews. Jews have come home to Israel, from Russia, from everywhere. We've seen the miracle of the ingathering of the exiles. We're seeing daily miracles in Israel, the survival of Israel. We get up, we take it for granted, I agree. And I, I hear from people who complain about rabbis not speaking about Israel all the time. But frankly, when we've tested these issues, we often find they're not capable of talking about Israel and dealing with the complex issues that we're talking about. I don't dismiss the questions of the of the, some alienation and stuff that goes on. But the, the core of the problem, I think, is really the educational system. We have abandoned our children. We do not educate them. We have tested this. Yeshiva kids, not yeshiva kids, they don't even come out much different. We have not prepared our children so that when they get to a campus and they meet a, a professors or others, they come into an atmosphere that they find hostile. They're not prepared to meet the challenge. You know, and we think birthright will save them if you ignore them 18 years of their lives and then send them to Israel and say, okay, you save them now. That's not going to work. We have to start with it, and that's why the Catholic Church says, give me a kid till he's six, you can have them the rest of their lives. We ignore our children. You know, I, I brought a group of school psychologists together once and asked them, what do you do about all the children who see the images of Israel on TV every day? Israel after a war, during Gaza, during any of the, the war in Lebanon in that case. And you know their conclusion was, come back in 10 years and we'll show you. So I try to find, where there was there material for kids who were young that you could use to interpret Israel, to explain Israel? And there's nothing. It's a failure of Israel, it's a failure of our educational system. We prepared a newsletter for high school students then in response to this, like the Daily Alert, but for high school students. We did one for campus, it was great. Number one, we could find no one who would fund it. So we, we funded it. We found that no teachers were using it. No schools were using it virtually. So we went and we started interviewing and finding out why. And they said, because we're not prepared to. We don't know how to explain this stuff. So we had to prepare a newsletter for the teachers the week before so they could teach based on that or about the issues. So there is a huge amount of ignorance and there's a, a simplicity to the approach that whatever is the common theme of the day, you know, you can hear it on certain radio stations, you hear it on other places, where, where we create a new reality that's not necessarily reflective of the reality. I think our community is extremely tolerant. I think that there is a broad tent. The President's Conference has everybody from ZOA to Peace Now. They sit there, they work, they deliberate together, they talk about issues. Now, right now, there happens to be a very broad consensus because we're not dealing with the issues. We're not dealing with territorial compromise. When that comes up, you'll have more divisiveness. Right now, Iran, everybody's unified. Syria, everybody's unified. Concern about Egypt, they're all unified. The Muslim Brotherhood, the uprising in, in the Middle East, the delegitimization of Israel. I don't know anybody who, who literally is outside the tent on those issues. There are people who try to carve out a niche. They often cre create myths to, to extol their own power or their prominence, but in most cases, it's a myth. And I will say about us, our, that Jewish power is generally built on a myth. Our job is to make it a legend, but we know that it's a myth and, and that it's the perception of others that really counts in, in that regard. So number one, I think that we should not fall into the trap and simplistically you know, dismiss and say how the community is restrictive and, or, uh, and inhibitive of, of free talk. It's not true. There are people who want to say outrageous things and they should be held to account on left and right and in the center, wherever it is. But if we continue to extol those who just are critical and who say these outrageous things about the alienation of, of young people, the distancing, the hostility towards Israel, we saw it during Stay Road. We saw how the community rallied from everywhere. People wrote us, people wanted to get involved, people wanted to help. When you mentioned Syria as one of the examples of uh, what, what we're all united on, I mean, my sense is that there's, um, there's great confusion about you know what a, what the right position should be. Everybody feels terrible about seventy thousand Syrians at least have been killed. You have a, a brutal dictator killing his own people, and yet it, it seems like American policy and and perhaps for others um, there's been a you know, the, the, the events have sort of outpaced our strategy so that. Um, it gets complicated. And if you give arms to the rebels, they may well be Al-Qaeda, or uh, you might have a failed state. I mean, it seems 
I mean, I'm, I'm just picking that one, um, but it, uh, where would the unity be on a, on a position on that? It seems like um, whatever unity. you do is, is very problematic. That's the unity. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <clears throat> that everybody agrees that it's problematic and what everybody else thinks. But let me just, uh, about the issue itself. Yeah. And as you know, I, I've had a lot of experience in regard to Syria, and I met, I was one of the last people to meet Assad before the fighting started, and so devoted a lot of time to trying to understand, and I meet with the Syrian opposition groups in, in various places and, and try to stay involved in it because it has broad implications, grave implications. But you know what? It doesn't matter because the Jewish community is not going to make the decisions on this. We have to focus on where, where it really matters. In the same way, we're not going to be the ones who draw the lines, the borders. So people want to say every inch or not one inch. I tell them do it, but do it in responsible ways. You can have any position you want, but remember, the ultimate decisions rest with the people of Israel have to live and die with the consequences. It's them who they and their government, democratically elected, we hope, that will uh, that have to focus and, and, and make the decisions and live with the consequences. And what, what I think we have to do is we have to look at what we're doing, the community, how we educate our young, what resources, how do we become more creative in approaching it to become, and again, it's not my generation, it's his, but to use the internet, to use the Twittering and Facebook and all these other things that I don't do any of, and to, to, to be able to communicate and let the, there's plenty of room for criticism. And nobody tells anybody, you're out of the tent if you don't happen to agree with X, Y, or Z policy. But know what you're talking about. There's something you said in there, Malcolm, that I'm not sure I understood. You said at one point, it doesn't matter what the Jewish community stance on this is. It's going to be <coughs> the decision of the American administration. It's an American policy issue, and it's not a Jewish issue. And my understanding of a lot of the work that you do, and organizations like yours, is actually to make the claim that the Jewish community has sufficient power to be able to sway, or at least influence, the policies of the American government. Is it po I mean, so That's a good question. When you say it's not a Jewish issue to actually decide, there's a weird dance that you're doing there between what power we actually have as a community and when do we actually want to wield it. That's exactly right. I think exactly it's altogether right. possible that um, part of the reason that there may not, that there is a Jewish consensus on this issue is because overwhelmingly Americans don't particularly understand the Syria issue. They don't see it as a important American issue. Um, they certainly don't want, under the Obama administration, to see a return of American troops back into the Middle East into conflicts that um, Americans don't understand. And it certainly doesn't seem to have an easy policy answer with respect to Syria that's actually even better for Israel. So a supporter of Israel, even a, 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 an, avow, a, an avowed, devout supporter of Israel, is not entirely sure what the right Ameri American administra administrative policy is. And I guess my question back to you is, I want, to, I want to make sure, I guess, or I'll put it as a statement, and then I'll inflect at the end to make it sound like a question. Um, that's the actually, Jewish approach. That's yeah. right. Um, I'm just anticipating the questions from the audience, um, uh, which is um, w if we actually do wield power as an American Jewish community through organizations like yours, through organizations like APAC and the American Jewish Committee, um, when, when do we get into this mode of the avoidance strategy of saying, it's not for us to decide, is the American Jewish community weigh in on, which is actually, um, a, a, in some ways, a failure of the willingness to appreciate the power that we actually have. Um, and here, I, and I want to push that this is both with respect to American policy issues, right? Um, but it also is with respect to Israeli policy issues and domestic Jewish issues and our willingness to say, look, if we do hold the mainstream consensus of the Jewish view on this issue, we wield a lot of power as the American Jewish community, and we have the potential to create influence both within the halls of the United States government, but also within the halls of Israeli government. And sometimes when I hear you say something like that, I say, well, it's just that they've decided that this is not an issue that's, not that, you know, to say it's not our decision to make, there's, there seems to be a, a dance around, well, I, I don't really care about that issue or I don't know, versus I actually have something to well, say. Well, sometimes, because there is no answer. Sometimes there is no simple formula we can say. Second of all, Jewish power is something you have to husband. We can't take on every issue in every instance. We have to use the influence we have in constructive and positive ways where we can. Uh, and that does mean that we will use it, that we were the ones who spoke out for the Muslims in Bosnia as a humanitarian issue. I think we're the only ones who are speaking out for the Christians who are being massacred across the the Middle East today. We have consistently, for years, been advocating with the administration, in international four, at the UN, about the, the killing of Christians from in Nigeria to Malaysia to Lebanon and Iran. 
I mean, thousands are being killed every year and nobody gives a damn. I mean, it, it's part of the distortion and misrepresentation in, in the region. So what I was saying about Syria was very specific and, and you picked it up, was saying that, that it, it's not the Jewish community because we're not in a position to make the decision which groups to back and which not to back. Now, as I said, I do meet with them and I try to, and the more I meet with them, the less I understand it because they don't understand it themselves. They don't even talk to each other, most of those groups. So there are times when we can't say to the administration, we want you to go in there and give arms because it's not a decision, a position, we're in to, a position to have the knowledge and the information to, to be able to, to construe what is the right approach. We can argue that we want to see the killing stop, which we have done uh, repeatedly. We think that America has a responsibility. I think America made big mistakes in the beginning when we could have had more influence and we could have made a difference. We made mistakes in we, the messages we sent, whether it was with Mubarak, the way we treated Mubarak, and many other things where we could, and we have communicated that. And we went to the administration about, uh, about those issues. So the, <clears throat> the question of how you use power and in what instances you do, I mean, there are moral aspects to it, there are practical aspects to it, each of those things you have to weigh each time you use it. The easiest thing to do, you know, when, when I headed the Soviet Jewry organization, the easiest thing was people to throw a brick through a window. You got a headline, you got everybody angry, but what did it accomplish? And then people often, you know, attack us and say, oh, you guys didn't speak about this. So I say, tell me one vote you changed on that issue. Did you, what did you accomplish? Because you can't do it all. You got to know how to set priorities. You have to pick the issues. Sometimes it's painful when you have to make those differentiations, but you have to husband it. You have to know which battles to take on. You have to know how to take them on in ways that don't destroy it. That, but, you know, I say it, it's like a muscle. You exercise it right, you build it up. You abuse it, which often happens, and then you destroy it ultimately. I mean, you know, I Winston just... Churchill once said to what you said, the further back you look, the further ahead you will see. We, we look back, it's not because we get lost in history in these things, but we learn the lessons of when Jews were powerless and when Jews didn't have the ability. People who have no responsibility can say anything they want and do what they want because it doesn't matter. When people have power or authority or responsibility, then it's different. You know, Sharpton could say anything years ago and make the most outrageous charges. Once he became uh, an establishment figure, he could no longer do it yeah, because responsibility imposes restrictions and, and limitations because you know that the words have consequences. So when it comes to an issue like Syria, I think we have certain limited responsibilities, mostly to understand it and see how it impacts Israel, how it impacts America, how it impacts the things of concern to us. Uh, the same thing is true in regard to, to uh, you know, a lot of the uprisings in, in the Middle East. But the, I guess the, go ahead. very quickly, the anxiety that I have is, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I, a lot, there's a lot. Um, um, is uh, there's a, in the Kuzari, the uh, 12th century uh, uh, book by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, uh, the dialogue between a, a Jew and the foreign king, the king of the Khazars. And there's two points in the book when in the dialogue the Jew has no response. And one of them, famously, and my, my colleague at Hartman, Micha Goodman, uh, pr talks about this quite extensively in his, in his new book on the Kuzari. Um, he writes that one of the times when the Jew has no response to the king is when the king says, you Jews, you have all of the pristine moral authority that you claim because you've never actually been tested. Put yourselves in a position where you're actually powerful, and then you'll actually have to be tested as to whether you are as morally superior as you claim to be in your tradition. The anxiety that I think we all have. But that's have, not comparable to our situation today. Well, yes We're and no. And no Jews have never, States, Jews, in Israel, Jews have never experienced power the way, the way we've experienced both in the context of living as Americans within America, as well as Jews living under a sovereign state. Our history of powerlessness has been a catastrophic story. And sadly, our history of actually when Jews have had sovereign power has also been a catastrophic story. It was not particularly good under the Davidic kings, and that fell apart pretty fast. It wasn't particularly good under the Hasmoneans, and that fell apart pretty fast. And now we're living at this unique moment where we actually wield extraordinary power and influence, both in the state of Israel and, um, and here as Jews in, in the United States. And if we if we exhibit this caution of an unwillingness to weigh in on, the on, on issues that we feel we shouldn't actually step on because we don't exactly know, are we actually failing to exercise moral no, leadership? We, we can, we, you're, you're su suggesting that we engage in things that we don't know could only lead to further disaster and further mistakes. 
w I do think we have a responsibility to speak out on issues. As I said, I cited some of them. I could cite many more that we're involved in all the time. But for me to, to, for, to suggest that we should get involved in the Syrian thing and tell the government which way and who, who to invest and who to give the money to, who to give the weapons to, they can't agree when the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State versus the Vice President and the President because they can't agree with supposedly having all the information. To rush into a situation like that is fools rushing in and then we would just screw things up even worse. It's not an avoidance of responsibility. It's how you ex exercise responsibility most effectively and most responsibly. You know, this weekend the uh, APAC conference is going to take place in Washington. There'll probably be more than 14,000 people. It's become uh, probably the, certainly the biggest uh, annual Jewish organizational event. Um, but the majority of American Jews, whether they are indifferent uh, or however else we want to characterize them, um, have kind of a different profile, tend to, uh, uh, many say that national Jewish organizations uh, don't really speak for them or don't reflect their views. So I guess my question is how, how relevant the national Jewish organizations are in terms of representing American Jewish community and how we how we gauge that that uh, influence. The issue of the relevance of, of American Jewish organizations. I do think American Jewish life and American Jewish organizational life is going through a major transition now. It's not noted by most people, but there is a major transition, and it's it touches virtually all the organizations. It's a sort of you know beneath the surface change. It's not necessarily always visible, but. I see it. And how, I see how, it how do you characterize it? That's a good question because it, in, in different instances, many organizations are moving toward marginality um, because issues that were once, you know, once motivated people, you know, uh, Christmas stamps, used to get people really excited. And today, nobody talks about the, those issues. Church state issues come up once in a while, but it doesn't have the prominence that it once had. A country club membership used to be a big issue that people mobilized around. You don't see it today. The, um, and there is a shifting of the, of the internal agenda. There's also a shifting of resources and the fact that young people are looking to, to new venues and new, creating new organizations, new institutional expressions. It's not, again, alienation. It's that <coughs> it's like the internet. A young guy, 21-year-old kid, sat down with me for an hour and a half, and he explained to me why the internet communication is so different than all the traditional ways we work. So organizations also, they, they need different kinds of expression, you know, to, to uh, find, and, and I think it's very healthy if they develop and find ways to make it relevant to them. But just to add to the question, Ma, it, no, it, it seems like the purpose of some of the, the major organizations, the reason why they were founded, um, may not be relevant I now, I, right? I, I mean, you. dealing with anti-Semitism, dealing with immigrants coming to America. Right. Um, is there a, a sense that younger people should be affiliated with them because it's the thing to well, do? Well, they could or take them over and change them and make them more relevant. I, I think the, the, that in many cases they're closed shops and it makes it hard for young people f from the outside to come in. Uh, and you know, as long as an organization has a president and executive, they're not going to go out of business. Although, the truth is that we have worked with several who did, and who recognized the fact that they were no longer there was no legitimacy to them continuing in the in that format. And we've helped with mergers, we helped with in other ways to to try and guide it. But it is a fundamental uh, shift. That's only one manifestation of it. I think to say that 50,000 people who belong to APAC or 75,000 people belong to APAC. It's not representative, not reflective of something. It, it is. How many organizations have 75,000 members? You know, how many organizations, that, especially of that nature? Uh, and when you take the collective, uh, the federations collectively, you take other organizations collectively, so, uh, th a, a, and compare it to other communities, I'm not saying in the totality, because we know half Jews are not affiliated and all those statistics that uh, everybody throws out. I'm not sure it was ever very different. That, that you, had, you never had 100% participation. You may have had more people going to synagogues on a regular basis. I think there's a return to the synagogue. I think the synagogue is going to become more central in Jewish life. And I think what we have to do is help facilitate whatever venue. And, and one of the reasons why I spent my life in umbrella organizations, though believe me, it's not easy, is because I really believe in Klal Yisrael. I really believe in bringing everybody together. We have always forces rendering us apart. 
but when you look at the bottom line, you find that what unites us far weighs the differences. And if you can get people to focus on that, and that's the goal of conferences, when they're sitting around the table, it's very easy to tell people to pit them against each other because you differ on this part or this part. But when you take the mainstream, you find out that there is a broad area of consensus on almost every issue. The one issues we don't deal with are halachic, because you can't have consensus on halachic issues, principal issues. But the, 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 the fact is that you have people coming together, working together, to, to, because they recognize it. And, and we have done too much to feed the divisiveness within the community. And one of the things I think we have to do is to refocus it. We're not going to have the resources in the future to continue the way we've operated in the past. It's going to shrink. And that means good is going to be destroyed with bad, you know. In, uh, and right now, I think the community should look back, and I advocated 15 or 20 years ago in a speech to do a zero-sum analysis where we say, let's start from scratch and see, not a MacIver report, which in the 50s, you know, tore the community apart and say the ADL should do one thing, committee should do another. So they threw away MacIver. And they threw away, they killed MacIver, right. <laughs> Um, and MacIver was at Columbia, and he did this uh, report that. Did you say MacIver? MacIver, <laughs> not my, Yeah, MacIver could have done a better job uh, with this than him. But the, but that the answer is not to 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 further divide and to to specialize. The truth is that I think our communal institutions do a better job than they're given credit for. I think our community is healthier than sometimes uh, we assess it to be. But we can't be lulled into, into complacency. We have to be willing to step back and say, these are no longer relevant, and we've got to have new approaches. And, and I, it, I start with education. I think it's really the key, because it's what we learned from the past, and we know for the future that Jewish education is the key. And if we're not going to do it in creative ways, or we're not going to keep young Jews and inform them and educate them, then they're naturally going to drift away and not be in a Jewish organization. But think about why is it that APAC is able to attract many people who do not have other affiliations, all the non-Jews who come, mm -hmm. but amongst the Jews. Because it, this political involvement attracts them, excites them, and that's what we have to give them. We have to give them things that bring them back and enervate them and make them feel that they're giving expression to their commitment to democracy, to their commitment to Jewish causes and to Israel. Just listen to, to the reaction when, when mm -hmm. you're there. I, so I would actually, yeah. I think we need to be a little bit more aggressive and assertive as a community in rethinking the paradigms of Jewish leadership and as opposed to allowing, um, you know, this organization to decline, that one to struggle, and these to peter out. I sometimes talk about this as the need for a little bit of a uh, Jewish organizational euthanasia for, um, for the institutions and organizations that are simply serving. You don't mean euthanasia. You no, mean no, no, no. Um, and, and serving. You mean sequester. Yes. Uh, <laughs> serving um, a need for the Jewish community that is simply no longer being articulated. I think the whole notion of what it means to convene a Jewish community, which the federations did for a long time, which organizations like yours, ADL, AGC, AJC, other types of organizations understood themselves as an umbrella organization at times when the community thought in those terms. If the community is no longer going to think in, the, think in those terms, first of all, you're going to see other organizations that are better capable of convening an interesting conversation. Because if you're only motivating people around a conversation that doesn't excite them, it's, you're no longer a motivator. Um, I, and, and just two examples on this. Once, uh, about a year ago, one of the, uh, some the senior person at one of the Alphabet Jewish organizations, uh, I was sitting with him and I said, what is your plan about Jews under the age of 50? He said, you have nobody involved in your leadership who's under the age of 50. And he said, our plan is that we expect that when they turn 50, they will join. Mm -hmm. I said, that is, I'm, I said, I was happy you have a plan. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's not a plan, but it also suggests to us as a community that we're not thinking, we're only thinking in terms of the legacy of history and ownership. I don't think we, we, we need to be substantially less sentimental as a Jewish community about the decline and fall of an or organization that's no longer serving a function, and much more generous with the organizations that are actually capturing the, the, the hearts, minds, attention spans of Jews who, and, and I look at my own demographic, there is no shortage of Jewish organizations and Jewish leaders who are enchanting, inspiring, incapable of, of building. They are oftentimes functioning outside the institutional Jewish community because they are either given the opportunity to be in the young leadership of a big organization or to actually lead. And given the choice between being in young leadership, which basically means you're going to sit at the bar with the bar mitzvah kids and drink ginger ale until you're ready to move up to the big kids' table, 
wh if I, why would I do that and not take a position of leadership where I can actually uh, achieve something in the Jewish world? Uh, two other examples to this effect. One is the story of the independent minyanim, um, which is something I was a part of in creating an independent minyan in Boston. They've been long maligned, these independent congregations, as something of a revolution against the denominational structures, as opposed to being the best story that the conservative movement could ever create, which was that its best alumni from, from USY and Ramah basically said, we could either be congregants or we could create inspired prayer spaces. Now, well, the problem was that innovation is sometimes thought of as in op is, is something that we all want in the Jewish community, but sometimes our institutions are not capable of dealing with it. So if you're stuck with a bricks and mortar type institution, it's very hard to tolerate the idea that somebody would be creating an innovative prayer space that meets in the basement of a church. So how do we find a way as a community to say, if those who have the resources, whether it's in terms of institutional structures, money, boards, actually get wedded together with the good ideas that take place within the context of Jewish life. And the second challenge is for if, if these convening Jewish institutions are going to stay relevant as the conveners of a conversation that was relevant for a long time, they're going to dramatically need to update the message of what it means to be a convener. And a good example was today, um, the ADL's response to Seth MacFarlane's kind of ludicrous Oscar performance, where somewhat predictably and almost laughably, the ADL's response was to focus entirely on the anti what they call the anti-Semitic tirade that the stuffed bear said um, in the middle of the Oscars, if anyone was still awake at that time. Now, what was so disappointing, to me at least, about that response is that the overarching message of the, uh, of the Oscars was a basic comfort with misogyny. That was the overarching message of it. Here you have an institution that positions itself as the Anti-Defamation League, and which says, we as the Jewish people do not tolerate the, the defamation of minorities, of women, of all uh, vulnerable populations. But the only response that the ADL said was, we're offended that you went after Jews in Hollywood. And it was, to me, a missed opportunity of how a, um, a long-standing legacy institution that was once the convener of a conversation could dramatically shift its place and remain the convener. They could be the address in the Jewish community where the Jewish community expresses its outrage and its unwillingness to tolerate um, offensive portrayals of any minority, of women, of any population that is more vulnerable. But by positioning itself as only a defender of Jewish pride, it is telling an irrelevant story and is making itself look entirely like partisan hacks. Well, I, think, I think in the, in, in, uh, I, I this happen to know a little bit about McFarland. the, That's the right. inside. I, I mean, I don't want to get into it, and I think, uh, frankly, and I mentioned before, I just think we should ignore that uh, incident, you know, arguing with a stuffed bear is a little hard, um, you know, and especially if he answers you, then you really have a problem. But I, I listened to some of the talk shows in the morning and saw how they mocked the, the concern about it. But uh, I happened to be with uh, somebody from the ADL who issued the statement, and he did not see the Oscars. In fact, I had gotten many emails about it from people of concern. I frankly had no idea. I didn't know there was a stuff there. I didn't even know there was the Oscars that night. Uh, I was at a wedding after Purim. And, you were and, tweeting. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was at a, a wedding, thank God, a good Jewish wedding. And um, so I don't think they knew about all this. And I'm not sure it would be the right thing for us to take on the misogyny and all the other issues that this, you know, ADL has become the focal point. They do take it on. They do defend women's rights, they do take on these issues, so does committee, so do many of the others. They take on the broader issues. Sometimes their members don't like it. They're saying, listen, you're there as a Jewish organization, focus with limited resources we have. They recognize that you need to be involved in the broader society because we have a sick society. We can be healthy and not believe that we're going to be immune to all of these, uh, these tendencies. But again, I think it's too easy just to be, to be critical. No, I think the point you make, I, I agree completely with your first point about the allocation of resources and trying to bring together the traditional establishment with youth, it's something I did for 40 years, tried to, when I started the North American Union of Jewish Students, I, I, I led the first demonstration at a federation. And because I was trying to bring their leadership into understanding where the students were coming from, and I still believe it very strongly today, um, that, that we have to have that kind of momentum within our community. It takes a lot of honesty, it takes a degree uh, of willingness to put yourself at risk in, in that process, which is hard for people to do. Uh, but I agree that it's necessary. Um, so let's talk about Israel a little bit, and um, in, in terms of its of its um, perception, and, and and many people see 
Of course, this current Israeli government is certainly in flux right now, right after an election, and uh, it's in the, in the stage of, of being formed. But the general perception, I think, um, among many people is that um, it, it's, it's um, hawkish in terms of uh, regarding the Palestinians, that there's been uh, little, if any, uh, progress on the Palestinian front in terms of settlements, occupation. Um, we have, uh, I guess the question is, how far does Israel have to go in that direction to have a, a, an impact on an American Jewish community and how they think about Israel, how they respond to Israel? Have to go in what direction? You know, as I said, the perception, I think, is that Israel has, the government has, has uh, either drifted toward or has held a position that on the right, and, um, and there's some pushback from some in the American Jewish community, but sort of what's, what's the threshold of, of where that impact really takes hold? Maybe we'll start with Yehuda. I mean, first of all, it's, um, we'll see whether Bibi is actually able to put together a government, and if not, uh, you know, we roll the dice again and figure out what the actual state of the Israeli electorate is. Um, Bibi ostensibly won the election with 25% of the vote, right? 25 to 26% of the vote. Having 30 seats in a 120 seat Knesset it means you've got essentially 25% of the vote. So that's winning an election, um, but it's also losing the overwhelming majority of the votes to a whole variety and constellation of parties. So it's, it actually, I'm not sure that the result of the election indicated um, the same, the assumption of the same kind of vote of confidence that we think it means when a person gets reelected to office, um, and what kind of mandate he actually brings in that in that role. Um, the obvious winner of the election um, in Lapid was a victory for a set of questions and conversations that Israelis have been stalling on for the past 15 years or so. I remember having a conversation with a Labor Party activist when back then when, when the Labor Party was like a big thing um, about 15 years ago, and he said to me. Um, at the time, this was actually was like the early 90s. He said to me, in the next five years, we're going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when we do that, there's going to be this overwhelming consensus by secular Israelis of reclaiming the mantle of responsibility with respect to building the, the social state that we want to create on issues of democracy and religion, religious pluralism and so on. And of course, that was um, both naive in terms of solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it also suggested an avoidance strategy that if we actually care about those issues, you know, like the rabbinic dictum, when I have time, I'll study, you never actually study. Um, in other words, I'll free myself up for that opportunity to do it. The, the Lapid victory was the reclaiming, I think, by a lot of Israelis of a desire to see the society that they want to actually have happen now. In, you can read it either as an apathy to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the simple shift in the priority list. I still care about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I care a little bit more about civil marriage, or I care a little bit more about resolving tensions between ultra-Orthodox Jews and non-ultra-Orthodox Jews. So, so the first thing I think we want to be attentive to is that dramatic change in Israeli society and the willingness to foreground some of those issues. But as you know, because we've talked about this before, um, I, um, I'm, I think the jig is up for a lot of North American Jewry about the, um, the, the continued stance of the Israeli government uh, with its um, basic belligerence towards advancing the peace process, which I find is masked in, well, we don't have a partner and we would be willing to do everything that needs to happen. When I talk to American Jews, they may not be the loudest American Jews, they may not um, be the ones who control mo most of the major Jewish institutions, but there is a large critical mass of American Jews who feel that we are abandoning our moral responsibility as, as Jews who hold power to, um, to not be a sufficiently um, critical and loving dialogue partner with the State of Israel to express what it means for us to actually have power and that the avoidance of the, um, of the Jewish people and the Israeli government in actually taking affirmative steps forward independent of whether there actually is a partner for peace on the other end is a failure of moral leadership. So well, let me uh, first deal with the question of the election. Uh, I, I don't think it, it comes to that kind of a sharp uh, differentiation. Uh, you saw that Sipi Libni ran on that and got what six seats. Uh, the other parties did, not because they don't believe it, certainly Lapid, others believe it and want to see it, but they know that it's not a relevant issue right now. It's not relevant because the Palestinians made it not relevant. And you can talk about Israeli belligerence and you talk about that. When you, if you go back to the facts, I think that 
They really are quite contrary, and I think the terminology is troublesome, certainly to me, when you, when you label a government and a prime minister who went to Ben Gurion, uh, to uh, uh, Bessa and spoke about a two-state solution, repeated it at the president's conference, talked about it openly at great political risk, and has implemented steps toward that end. He, he did release the funds. He did do other things in the face of, an, of a, a boss who has done everything to stymie, and people in the administration will admit it. Everybody admits the frustration. They put the pressure on Israel because they can't put pressure on him because you know, the threat is always that he will fall and that he's better than the alternative. At some point, he won't be better than the alternative, and people will start looking at it differently. The, the frustration that exists. So first about Lapid, the fact that 81 members of the Knesset said to Paris, we want Bibi as the prime minister. So it wasn't, it doesn't, this election I think was different than other elections. And you, you can never analyze it because you know they say Israelis are the only people who tell the truth to pollsters and lie at the polls. You can never predict what, what, what they are really saying. There was a big protest vote, I, I agree with you. And I do think people are tired and, and want to see action on this social agenda. But Lapid was smart because he shut up most of the time. And he keeps going up. The more he shuts up, the more he goes up. Every time uh, the others open their mouths, they go down. I mean, if you would see the new polls, they show labor going down again, and uh, Tzipi Livni disappearing, and Kadima you know, becoming a negative uh, numbers of seats in the I mean, it all shifts around because it's once you open your mouth, when Bibi and uh, Bennett started fighting, both of them went down, Lapid went up. Do, does anybody know what Lapid stands for? And I, I like him, I think he's uh, very articulate, I think he does represent something, but he is for keeping Jerusalem united, he's for keeping the settlement blocks. This is not you know, some sort of left wing, not coming there and, and advocating uh, positions. So I think it's, it, the Israelis are more sophisticated and it's a more nuanced than to divide it up this way. Israeli politics needs reform, I, I agree completely, I think there has to be some revolution in the system. You can't have 34 parties so that a good number of votes are just wasted. But the, the consensus on the issue of the Palestinians is clear. 65% or 75% of Israelis want peace negotiations, want immediate uh, um, talks, and are prepared to make serious concessions. I think Netanyahu is committed to peace and would, make, would nego to negotiate tomorrow. I spoke to him about it just last week in a private meeting where he had no reason to grandstand with anybody else. I believe that he is committed to it. But you can't impose it. It's the same thing that President Obama learned when the first term, when he wanted to do his own peace process and peace. It's the same thing Bush learned, the same thing Clinton learned, the same thing Bush won learned. You can't impose it. It has to come organically and you need the parties to do it. I'm not saying Israel did everything right. And I'm not going to excuse where I think that there were mistakes and sometimes mistakes of a stupid nature like when Biden was there and some third level you know, bureaucrat announces that, and it wasn't really building, he announced that it went through another stage in the clearance process for building. But to see the ludicrousness of this, when you see the whole world focused on E1. I went to the UN that day, I took a map and I said to the people who were discussing it, can you show me where's E1 on the map? They didn't have a clue, it was in Connecticut to them. They didn't know. We went with Mayor Barkat and he took the President's Conference, which includes many people on the left and then on the right, and most in the center, and he took him and showed him what E1 looks like. It's a barren hill that no one ever lived in, in the middle of nowhere, that doesn't obstruct contiguity, and it doesn't, there's plenty of ways that you can bypass it all, and I'm not saying it? that they should build them, huh? So who needs it? So, so I'm not saying that, you, well, it is important to Israel because it's a land bridge to Mala Duming. It's the way that tr if you ever have to move troops into the west, you need that land bridge. But, but it wasn't because somebody else had it and they're taking it from it. And I think the announcements are sometimes really dumb, that it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be all these public pronouncements, and especially because nobody's building. They just make announcements about the fact that they will build and they will pass the, the um, zoning requirements if it ever should come to it. So I think that we have to be more, a little bit step back and be more objective about how we assess where, where Israel is at. I think that all the governments of Israel, the five prime ministers I think now, or maybe six, have said they want a two-state solution. Sharon so disengaged me, so just, and got beaten up for I it. just want to add to this question no. that you're responding to now. So last week, uh, Giddy Grinstein was at uh, Limud, New York, and talked about, from the Ray Wood Institute in Israel, the think tank, um, he said, look, the, the PLO can't make peace even if they wanted to, they have no parliament, that if Israel seriously wants a two-state solution, uh, and fears that the alternative would be a one-state solution, which would be terrible, that if they really want a two-state solution, 
that one possibility is to recognize the PLO, to recognize the PA as a state now and deal with it, that otherwise you're going to lose that opportunity. Yeah, but you can't do that. It's the same mistake that happened at the UN. You can't do it because you leave the people then disappointed. If they get up the next day and nothing has changed, are you going to create artificial borders and then say, now we're going to negotiate on it? It's the same thing people say. Well, have a unilateral declaration. Israel should withdraw again. And then you're going to just create another unstable situation. We learned from Gaza you can't have unilateral. It has to be done in conjunction with the other party so that you create circumstances where they could fill in and they can do it in a more gradual way than this happened and not the disaster that, that occurred in Gaza. You can't afford that. It's even much greater to do it in the West Bank. It doesn't mean that there can't be creative ideas, that there can't be things. But I can tell you there are much, there's much more going on than people know. And I don't know it all, but I know of many contacts, many negotiations, other parties who were involved, back, door, back channels, front channels, side channels, right and left channels who've been trying to do it. And each time, Abbas, and you're right, he can't negotiate. He's A, hasn't been elected. He's not a legitimate the leader. The parliament hasn't met in, in five or six years. The, the, uh, the PLO is the one charged with negotiations, but he doesn't want to recognize it because then that cuts out the PA. He's afraid of Hamas coming in. I mean, he has some legitimate concerns. The, the, the Arab world today is sick and tired of them. They don't, want to, they don't send the money. They don't do anything because they don't give a damn about it anymore. They have much bigger problems. They have Iran. They have other things that they're focused on. It, the Palestinians could change the, the thing. Why don't they test Netanyahu? Netanyahu? Yeah. Sit down and see if they can work it out. But you can't you have it both ways with the apologetics around D1. Right? You can't. You can't, mean? Say. you can't say, on one hand, the, the, simp the, the problem here is simply the inability to find a partner who is capable of negotiating and implementing. And at the same time, it doesn't matter to the, you know, it, it doesn't matter that it is a barren hill. It's just, you know, it, it, when, you ha when you hold on to both of those ideas simultaneously, where you say, essentially, we're going to move forward and create, you know, the, the, with the Hebrew term, uvdot bashetach, realities on the ground in the West Bank that change the status quo, and at the same time say that the only issue is the obstacle of the inability to have a partner who has any that's political capability. I'm not capability. saying that. And, and, and I don't the think that that's here, the really the issue. The difference here is issue. between whether you're talking about the Isra Israel's pursuit of the peace process as a political goal or as a moral imperative. And there, there's a dramatic Why difference be between both? the two. Because what happens is, when it becomes a political issue and you say simply, I don't have a partner on the other end, you become disincentivized as a society and as the Jewish people to reach a solution until you actually have the conditions that enable you to bring it about. Right. When you have a moral imperative as a people, you do everything that you're capable of doing as a people in order to prevent the possibility of that failing. And that has not happened. The, for the State of Israel it is treating um, the, the peace process as a political imperative only when there is political possibility for it to happen. It is not treating it as a moral imperative because then we wouldn't see the E1. But, but a moral imperative today is, is what happened in Gaza. You can't create artificial circumstances and to try and with all the good intention and goodwill, I do believe that there's a moral imperative involved in, in part, but, it, the, the, but it's not separate and apart from the political narrative. And I think the distinction you make is, is an interesting one, but it's not a practical one. When Israel has tried repeatedly, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not whitewashing and saying that everything they did was right. My point about E1 was that the world focus on something of minor significance when much larger things, the Arabs are creating many more facts on the ground than the Jews are. And you don't hear the outcry, you don't hear the kind of reaction, you don't hear, the, I mean, the whole world focused on E1 when 70,000 Syrians are dying, as you said before, when many other issues. What I think is imperative is that Israel, and I think Netanyahu, has moved to limit any construction, certainly government construction, to the areas that will be part of the blocks, that everybody agrees will remain with Israel, and they're willing to make the exchange. I'm not going to go to the history of what Barack offered and what everybody offered, which shows that Israel was prepared. You had leaders who were prepared to make un incredible offers, maybe even irrational offers, to get peace, and were rejected each time. Clinton wrote about it. Everybody wrote about it. But when you look at the situation today, you can't unilaterally make peace and not endanger Israel's future existence. You can't say either that we, we withdraw to a, a, a line that we determine, they're never going to accept it. And Abbas can't negotiate for many other reasons. He'll never say no right of return, he'll never say other things. You know, he gave an interview on one TV uh, station and then the next day had to retract it because of the, the onslaught of, of criticism and stuff. So th there are fundamental factors, and the international community has a role to play to say to Abbas, no more. 
We're not just going to excuse everything you do. We're not going to let you continue to idolize martyrs and people who kill Israelis. We're not going to lay, raise, raise a generation of hatred. Israel, we want you also to be moving forward in the certain steps that, that they can take and give them the confidence to be able to take it. Then I think we have a chance, but it's not going to happen under the circumstances today where Abbas sees he pays no price, he can go to the UN, elevate the status, violate the Oslo Accords, violate all the agreements, and there's no penalty. And now we, now we hear the administration wants to have, to, remove, uh, per, to have a permanent waiver on all UN agencies. Well, what is the message? And to Abbas, we're saying to him, look, you can go to the WHO, you can go to IEA, you're not going to pay a price. We're not going to punish the agencies. We're not going to cut off our funding. And, and the administration has good reason for doing it. But I'm saying we always miss the message that we're sending to the people we deal with. In the Middle East, perception is more important than reality. It's what is, how does Khamenei perceive when we move a, an aircraft carrier? We have good reason, financial, other reasons why we're taking it out. But then that destroys the military option in his eye. When we do the same thing, when we say to the Palestinians, we're not going to have the ability to extract any price for whatever you do, then what, what, what incentive is there for our boss to say to his people, look, I don't want to punish it, I don't want to have a, I don't want to put, subject you to cutting off all the aid and cutting off the money from, from outside. Okay. So I'm going to ask you each for just really for just like a um, maybe a one minute uh, takeaway from from uh, what you'd like to leave uh, a message for this audience to uh, who's been a wonderful audience by the way. I mean, first of all, I have to say that I'm it's the first time I really met you the, except when he was a little boy. I think his mother would say or would, would know um, that it's really encouraging that you have young people like that who are devoting themselves to Jewish communal service and to leadership and it's really a, a pleasure and to have somebody who thinks, uh, which is a, a luxury that most Jewish leaders don't have. And I think that the first uh, takeaway is, again, the importance of having opportunities to discuss it, to hear other points of view, not to assume what other people believe. And because somebody writes a headline, you know, anybody can say anything they want in a headline, as you know, but to really understand the substance of, of, of where we are, why these things are so important and how we move ahead collectively, and how we try to bring everybody in. It doesn't mean every single individual will find a place in the tent, but that it has to be open to the sense of, of recognizing that throughout our history, there's only one precondition for every great thing that happened to the Jewish people, and that was Jewish unity. That when Jews were united, you could overcome every challenge. When Jews are divided, every challenge was too great. It's a lesson for Israel today that we can't afford the kind of divisiveness and pitting groups against one another, and they don't like Haredim, and they don't like secular, and they don't like this, and they don't like that. We can't afford it. We can't afford it today when we have, as somebody said to me yesterday, so many enemies and so little time. You know, we have so many challenges right now that we need all the resources of our community. We need to work collectively. We have to have an atmosphere of respect for the differences that exist but also for the commonality of one faith and one faith. And what happens to one of us, one part of the Jewish people happens to all of us. And that we have to move beyond this moment where it seems that the only way you get recognition is if you can show how you differ and how you split the community, not how you unite the community. So uh, I couldn't agree more about the, the possibilities for intercommunal discourse. On that point, I'm very grateful to share the stage with you, Malcolm, and, and to Gary for convening this and for for being a convener of serious conversations in the Jewish community, as you do in the paper every week. Um, I think one of the things that, at the risk of drawing an extremely broad stroke for everyone my age or below, um, I think one of the, um, one of the characteristics that's just, that characterizes uh, these, gen these emerging generations of Jewish life is the desire for a conversation that is not frightening, that a conversation that uh, a previous generation needed the motivation of fear because of their own life experiences, and, 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 and that sustained deep, profound uh, Jewish identity because it was rooted in their own personal biographies and their family stories. And if you grow up at a time, and I mentioned this earlier, in which you are growing up with not, uh, not the ex same existential fear of our grandparents' generation, um, but a different kind of dull um, sensation of this may not be as good as we want it to be, um, the only way to animate a serious engagement with Israel or Judaism, not just Israel, but Judaism within an open marketplace where we as Jews are capable of sampling from everything the world has to offer us, is going to have to be a conversation that's not catalyzed entirely by fear, but has to be a, ca a conversation that's catalyzed by opportunity. Part of the reason I talk about Israel's um, 
uh, Israel and the, the need to create its challenge, to turn its challenges into moral imperatives is because a morally aspirational conversation is a conversation that I think the Jewish people can have. We have a good history on morally aspirational conversations, and it is a conversation fundamentally that invites in a broad swath of Jews from different generations to say, in what ways can Judaism bring something better to the world? In what ways can a Jewish state be something that we want it to be? And I, I, I hope that um, as we advance a conversation around Israel, either between the two of us, between our organizations, and in the broader community, we find a way not to simply um, devolve back to the aspects of Israel that are going to scare us into caring about it, but we find ways to talk about Israel as a challenge in which we can have a, we can play a role at bringing around the Israel that we want to see. That's great. Just thank you both. Just a, a, a closing word, and I think the message maybe for me for a takeaway and from uh, really enjoying hearing both of you talk about these big issues and, um, and having the opportunity to be here with you all this evening um, is, is that it's when you have to contribute yourself, when you get involved, when you do something, um, that's when progress is made. So I think that's uh, hopefully something that we can all uh, think about in terms of our, our daily lives in the Jewish community and some of the major issues that we talked about tonight and that, and that we're facing. So again, I want to thank uh, Malcolm and thank Yehuda and, and thank uh, Rabbi Ain and the people here at Sutton Place for, uh, for this wonderful opportunity and wish you all a good evening. Thanks very much for being here. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.